But when I was with The Lancet, I, people replied, professors of medicine at Harvard replied within five minutes. You know, you could talk to anyone. You could go to any conference you wanted. They would invite you to dinner afterwards. I mean, it was a fantastic place to be. Thanks to the internet and thanks to your program and many others, we're now seeing two groups, groupings of people, the ones who've been red-pilled, as it were, who know that the Anglo-American version of history is distorted. And then the people, I guess, often they're in the elites in our society who still stick to that narrative. I was there in, in, in London during the Iraq War 2003. For journalists in my generation, that was the defining moment. We thought, well, we can't tell any lies after this. But hey, just a few years later, they went to war in Libya with about the same false grounds, the same drum roll of propaganda about Gaddafi being an evil dictator and the new Hitler. You literally had um, activists or Islamists being flown from the war in Libya, which they'd just destroyed, into Turkey and then down into Syria so they could destroy Syria. Then Putin assisted the legal government of Syria in 2015 and basically saved Syria from the chaos that has destroyed Iraq, the chaos that destroyed Libya. And what does the British press say? Putin is, the dictator is supporting another dictator. If they could turn Russia into an adversary, they could kind of go back to this kind of Churchillian dream of being the, the conscience of the world, you know, just like World War II, just like World War I, where the British were up there standing for freedom and standing for the West and everybody else would follow. A lot of refugees in Sweden, I talked to a lot of them, they love Putin because they say, well, he saved us from the Western-sponsored Islamists. But you tell Swedes, they say, oh, that's Putin propaganda, you know. And you say, well, maybe the Syrians know what's going on in their own country. No, no, they don't know what's going on in their own country. Some Iranian woman said to me, you know, we're damaged by war in Iran, but you are damaged by peace. You are not used to fighting for your rights. You're not used to thinking that your leaders can do bad things because you assume after 200 years of peace, you think that when your leaders do something, they must know something you don't and they must be better at assessing the situation and you trust them. But sometimes you shouldn't trust them. So Swedes are like lemmings off a cliff now, I think. And I'm pleased to announce that we now have an agreement that paves the way for Finland and Sweden to join NATO. Zweden wil bij de NAVO, maar Turkije en Hongarije geven nog geen groen licht. De Zweeds-Britse journalist Pelle Taylor maakte er een documentaire tweeluik over. Hij werkte in het verleden voor onder andere The Lancet en The Guardian, maar verruilde Engeland voor Zweden waar zijn roots liggen. Zijn werk is zowel urgent als educatief, want zeg nou eerlijk, wat weten wij nou eigenlijk van Zweden? De rol die ze eeuwenlang speelden en de gevaren die nu op de loer liggen. Als je het mij vraagt, bitter weinig. En daarom vroeg ik Pelle om hier naartoe te komen. Helemaal hier naartoe te reizen met een trein. En meer te vertellen over zijn werk, zijn zorgen en zijn kijk op zowel het conflict als de oplossing. Pelle Taylor. How lovely to have you here. You came all the way to Edam <laughs> by train and bus. How was your trip? It was fine. It was very interesting to see uh, Europe at this period, you know, uh, in, uh, and uh, just comparing them to each other and comparing them to Sweden. And um, uh, train doesn't show you that much, but it shows you a little bit. So although it was a long journey, I didn't mind it too much. How much time did it take? Well, it took 12 hours from Copenhagen and... Um, six hours from my town in Sweden, because Sweden's quite a big country, so 18 hours in all. I wouldn't do it every every week, but I can't fly at the moment because of my doctor's orders, but um, um, I flying with all the security provisions and controls and check-ins and so on, I think a train could be the future of European travel. So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I and I'm surprised to see how similar the Netherlands feels like, it feels like a Scandinavia a little bit, a mixture of Brit some British elements and some Scandinavian elements, whereas Germany feels a little bit more run down. And um, I saw some Ukrainian refugees, you know, it's got that kind of transitional feel, which is shows you some of the crisis that's going on in Europe, you know. So 
Um, but then the problem with journalists is that we extrapolate from small data, you know, we make ge big generalizations. So I have to be wary of that, you know, I mean, I only saw a train, so. Yeah, let's let's zoom out today yeah, yeah. And, and look at it from a different perspective. But for the people who are watching and also myself, I would like to know more about Pelle Taylor, your background. Tell me, who, who are you? I've got two passports. I was brought up, I was born in England. My parents separated and my mum, my dad was in advertising, my mum was a designer and a model and came back to Sweden. And um, they were both very prominent in the creative professions in the UK. And um, I, Sweden was very much in the rage in, 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 in the UK, this idea of the Bergman and, and Swedish modernity and blondness and so on. And there was a series of films about um, featuring uh, um, a woman called El 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 Elvira Madigan and so on. So Sweden was all the rage. Anyway, well, we went back to Sweden. I went through part of the Swedish school system. And then when I was 15, I went back to the UK um, and then spent most of my university years. I went, I did mathematics and philosophy at university. And then I went on to do journalism after being a, a features editor for the student paper and went to the U London's main journalist school. And then I worked in journalism uh, on and off for 20 years as a, a science journalist and uh, occasionally writing articles for the UK uh, m normal daily press and being a sub-editor doing shifts at the various newspapers. So I've been around in, in what used to be known as Fleet Street, entirely working obviously in English. And a lot of my uh, friends and colleagues uh, were also working in, so I knew, I, I know how it works and I'm, I've known the inside of most of the big newspaper offices in London. And I followed UK mainstream journalism very closely. I knew exactly what went and what didn't go. Um, but I was sort of, um, and then I, I worked in Brussels. I lived in Brussels for a bit and tried to, to work. I worked in science journalism. I wrote for The Lancet, wrote for The New Scientist. And um, I wanted to, I, and then I met a Swedish girl who I'd known at university and in the UK, she'd been an exchange student and we kind of fell in love. And then I went to Sweden to just get a different perspective. I was, um, I got very tired of London in a way and um, tired of a sort of, a, it was a kind of personal crisis because I wondered just, I wanted to write longer projects and I wanted to scope out of the daily, the, the chasing the next features article because you're thinking you can't, you, you need to make a longer term investment into career projects that'll really make your name. And so I thought, well, if I base myself in Sweden, I'll, first of all, I thought at the beginning, um, if I'm out of it, um, I'll be out of it. I always thought you have to be in New York or London to make it. But then I realized after about a year in Sweden, it's actually better to be out of it because um, I was there with the growing skepticism around the world, and as this outlet shows, against the mainstream media. So the more I've been in Sweden, the more I realized that actually this wasn't the pinnacle of journalism, it was the sewer of journalism. I mean, work, working for the mainstream press, you actually have to give up a lot of your principles. How did Sweden make you see that? Well, I think it's just, well, it's, it's in the walls, as is a Swedish expression. If you're sitting at The Guardian, um, there are just some things you don't talk about, you know. I mean, I remember being in the pub in the evenings and just saying a thing or two, and the subject was steered in another direction. Is that the self-censorship that it's you see nowadays? Kind of, yeah, it's a self-censorship. That's the root of the self-censorship. It's not somebody bans you, or they don't ask you back for, an, they don't give you another freelance job. I mean, it's quite exclusion techniques, you know. So almost the different, a lot of the people you see in mainstream journalism today, they're not the top of their professions. They're the ones who trod a very careful line and didn't touch the electric railway line, as they call it the third rail, which the, is the ca electricity carrying line in a railway, right? which electrocutes them and kills them. They're the ones who play it safe. They're the ones who are best at office politics. They're the ones who can read and listen to what the boss really wants you to say and so on. So they're not, they're, and they're also quite, they're the most conformist ones. They're not the best ones. And that made me realize, well, I don't need to sit in London, New York, New York. And that was an impression I had then. And it's become stronger and stronger as we become more and more aware that on nearly all the big stories of the 2010s, the media have been on the lies uh, on the on the front line of outright lies and propaganda. So I'm very glad. Although, of course, if you need to pay your mortgage and raise a family, then you sit there where you sit, you know, uh, and then you can 
get your salary. But the question is, I mean, some of those people might feel, well, I'm telling the truth and they're not. And some people might be just cynical. They say, well, I know, we know we have to tell lies, but hey, I mean, I, I get a career promotion and I get my salary and I get invited to those conferences Give me and so an on. example of a lie that well, is, is okay, being told by journalists. I think they, pro well, the, the first lie, the thing is that they, they the more I researched back, I, I, I researched, I, I just researched the South Africa issue. I grew up with apart the anti-apartheid struggle. In a way, I'm, I'm kind of revisiting the, the things of I, I grew up with in the 1980s. And if you remember the 1980s, the Cold War was less important than the anti-apartheid struggle. The anti-apartheid struggle was the big thing. It's like the trans and gay rights movement of today. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing something about South Africa. Well, I went down to South Africa and I got a much more modified version of that. The ANC were not angels. They were probably assets of the, some of the people say they were assets of the Western intelligence agencies. They've run the South Africa into the ground, basically, although we haven't heard about that. But let's say the Iraq, I was there in, in, in London during the Iraq war, 2003. That was probably the last big affair that the British and American media says, yeah, we were wrong about that. But and for journalists in my generation, that was the defining moment. We thought, well, we can't tell any lies after this. But hey, just a few years later, they went to war in Libya with about the same false grounds, the same drum roll of propaganda about Gaddafi being an evil dictator and the new Hitler. The British media always like to talk about Hitler because that's the thing that can rally the British population very closely. And then they destroyed Libya, and there was actually a British parliamentary inquiry saying, well, uh, Gaddafi was not about to massacre his own people. Uh, and, uh, you know, 10 years after that war, Iraq, uh, Libya lies in ruins. They didn't learn from that, even though just, they just had Iraq. Then they, then they plunged uh, Europe into a proxy war with Syria by sponsoring the Islamists who caused trouble for Assad. And they didn't report their own intervention. They only reported Assad's crackdowns. And they said that's a proof of he's a dictator because they knew that they couldn't send in ground troops to topple the Syrian government because after Iraq, that couldn't be, that was not acceptable to the public. What they did was a deception operation to make it seem they concealed their own use of proxy forces to destroy, to try and destroy Syria just as they destroyed Libya. I mean, the, the you literally had um, activists or Islamists being flown from the war in Libya, which they'd just destroyed, into Turkey and then down into Syria so they could destroy Syria. Then Putin assisted the legal government of Syria in 2015 and basically saved Syria from the chaos that has destroyed Iraq, the chaos that destroyed Libya. And what does the British press say? Uh, Putin is invaded, Putin is, the dictator is supporting another dictator. People in Syria, the, a lot of refugees in Sweden, I talked to a lot of them, they love Putin because they say, well, he saved us from the Western-sponsored Islamists. But you tell Swedes, they say, oh, that's Putin propaganda, you know. And you say, well, maybe the Syrians know what's going on in their own country. No, no, they don't know what's going on in their own country. And then, of course, you have the... I, I wrote a book about the origins of World War I um, during the COVID crisis. And I looked, I read hundreds of uh, books and diplomatic documents and so on. And it was my magnum opus, if you could say. And I concluded that the war was actually started by the Western side, the allies, as it were, the, the French, Russians. So the Russians are the bad guys in this and the British because Germany was too good. They were winning too many Nobel Prizes. They were growing too fast, but they were not militarily aggressive. And then they destroyed Germany. And there's actually quite a lot of literature about this in the 1920s, saying that the Germans were relatively innocent of World War One. But then, you know, Hitler came and then all Germans are bad and it's whatever Germans do is bad. So I realized that Maybe all, all historical events have been defined by the Anglo-American empire. And we all, the, this is one thing we know from history is that the winners all right, always write history, okay? And we've lived in a hegemony. That's why we're speaking English in this uh, program. And so I'm benefiting from the fact that the British and the Americans have controlled the 20th century. And they probably don't, they have done a lot of good things. I mean, I am British, but we also have to realize that a lot of history is being constantly twisted, you know? And I think that thanks to the internet and thanks to your program and many others, we're now seeing two groups, groupings of people, the ones who've been red-pilled, as it were, who know that the Anglo-American version of history is distorted. And then the people, I guess, often they're in the elites in our society who still stick to that 
narrative. And um, of course, you know more than me, the, you've got the corona crisis, which uh, the, the, the fact that ivermectin doesn't work, the fact that the vaccines are good for you, the fact that uh, uh, COVID is a lethal disease for the young fact diseases. That the Lancet, the paper the Lancet, that you worked for, exactly lied about exactly. ivermectin. So, I mean, the Lancet was, I mean, the most prestigious job I ever had because in the medical profession, I mean, it's, you, you know, has it, if you're a freelance journalist and you try to contact someone, they always Google you, you know, or they always look at your email address. But when I was with the Lancet, I, people replied, professors of medicine at Harvard replied within five minutes. You know, you could talk to anyone. You could go to any conference you wanted. They would invite you to dinner afterwards. I mean, it was a fantastic place to be. And um, I had, everyone was, and medic, medicine is an incredibly interesting profession. And so, but now I feel deceived in a way because I realized that, and I, the editor, I fell out with the editor, Richard Horton. I realized that he's also part of the lie in a way. I don't know, maybe that's libelous, but <laughs> I shouldn't say that. The Lancet, this pinnacle of journalism, also gets it wrong uh, in, in a deliberate way, it seems, if you, if you look at the articles that have been written about this thing. So they, what they do, they, The Lancet um, basically produced a fraudulent paper, um, which was quite obviously fraudulent, that said that some of the alternative cheap medicines like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine could actually cure uh, or mitigate the effects of c corona. And it, these were off patent, very cheap medicines that had been cured. Uh, one was a malaria cure, the other was a cure for river blindness, had been used for tens and of millions of people. And could also block the rollout of this fast-tracked exactly. vaccine. And, it's, uh, and so, they so within a week of that article being published, I think Oxford University stopped its trial uh, the WHO stopped its trial. All the prestigious places in the world that were conducting trials on these cheap medicines stopped, almost as if it was a co coordinated event. Then a week after that, you know, a lot of, a lot of prestigious doctors are saying, well, hang on, who, who are these doctors who wrote this paper? You know, um, they, they, their website doesn't seem to indicate that they're a serious operation. Um, where are the hospitals that they contacted from? They, the, the, the data seems suspiciously streamlined. I can't remember all the details. And, and Richard Horton, the editor, said, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we retract it. The paper was wrong. And this received a small amount of coverage on the BBC website. And then the story died. But it's so... But do you believe that this is an accident? No, no, no. I, I, so well, how does it make you look back on your... Well, in a way... Contribution to this. Exactly. So in a way, I'm, I've got the zeal of a convert, you know. I went to live in Sweden, which for a British journalist is like, oh, why you, you, you're going off the career track. So I guess I'm always looking for something to show that I did the right decision, you know. And um, so in a way, I'm, I'm, I, if you're asking for somebody to praise the UK media, you're asking the wrong guy, you know. I'm looking for faults in them, and I certainly found it in that, you know. And um, certainly about the, now the Ukraine war, I think um, the British are leading, the British press are the most hawkish, the most hostile, the most aggressive, the most one-sided, the most unfair, and the most dangerous, because what they're doing is that they are provoking Russia, I mean, personal insults, I mean, wars... In but, but why? Why? Well, I think it's got to do with power. I think that... Um, I mean, okay, it's complicated. The British are looking for a role after Brexit, okay? I mean, um, the British felt that um, the EU was putting pressure on the UK by excluding some of the, make, making trade deals hard, making trouble over whether Northern Ireland should join the free trade area of Southern Ireland and the rest of Europe. And they felt that they were, they, they were not building trade deals in the rest of the world with America, with, with Australia. That was promised by all the Brexiteers. But I think the top leadership of Britain was thinking the new Britain unshackled from the European dictatorship. And I mean, they're not completely wrong in their critique of the EU. I'm quite skeptical of the EU now. But they were, they did not want to become just another country. They were going to show that we've won Brexit. The Germans are 
defeated, if you like, that they, 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 their dictatorship is not going to rule us. Now we're, we're, the new Britain is going to show that it's a real player in the world. And they knew that even though they were excluded from the EU, they were still a very powerful force in NATO. So they could, they could, if they could turn Russia into an adversary, they could kind of go back to this kind of Churchillian dream of being the, the conscience of the world, you know, just like World War II, just like World War I, where the British were up there standing for freedom and standing for the West and everybody else would follow. So it was basically a sort of... So they need an enemy. Exactly. To, to big themselves up, to make the British big again and is important. Is it perverse? I think it is, yes. I, and I think, but I mean, it, uh, empire, and, and I think that they had a lot of Americans who felt the same, you know. They've, and, and there's a lot of... I mean, if, if, if you would not... talk to your, your old colleagues in, in the UK and you would ventilate these kind of opinions, do they, they... think you, you're, you, you're showing rational ideas or do they think you're a conspiracy theorist? I think, I don't know, but the British, my British friends who I, I, I circulate all my ideas and articles. I mean, I'm part of a, a kind of discussion, informal discussion groups and I, I uh, and I meet people and so on, uh, they don't get it, unfortunately. Um, and I think the British, I mean, the British are always saying, let's say, the, 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 the Russians really need to get to terms with Stalin. Um, they, they, they never learn, or the Americans are so brainwashed, but the British are also brainwashed. And they still live in this Churchillian fantasy uh, that they're always right, and they, they're always fighting dictators. And um, sadly, I think the countries that are culturally most influenced by Britain, and that is Scandinavia and Holland, Netherlands, are st uh, uh, the Dutch are still kind of remember when Montgomery came in his tanks, you know, and liberated it from the Nazi rule. And of course, they all speak English and watch English football and so on. So it's very, very strong tendency for the Dutch, I think, to, to follow the British interpretation of all history. And I think that you need, I think that um, it, in an open debate, it might be that I'm 60% right and, and the pro-British are 40% right. And I'm not going to make their arguments for them, but let them, that, that you can't expect everyone to be, I, I'm, I'm kind of strong in my views and I'm not saying I'm completely right, but let all the ideas be up, out in the open against each other. But there's very little dissent in the UK. Uh, there's much more dissent in America, for instance, uh, much more anti. The British, um, America's much more critical of the CIA and they talk about the CIA covert operations, CIA buying of politicians and journalists and carry out coups everywhere. In Britain, the, nobody talks about MI6. I think the MI6 have much more control over the British debate than CIA has control over the American debate. So I think, um, um, yeah, so I feel free and I think that um, the, so being in Sweden, actually being in a small town where people are not so, it's not a hot house of competition and so on. And I go for long walks in the forest. Is actually being away from it has made me closer to the truth than being in the center of it, I think. That's interesting. Yeah. And we're going to talk about your documentaries. Yeah. Part one and part two about Sweden entering NATO. But you made some work before about immigration in yeah. Sweden and also about feminism. Yeah. Um, we'll put the links also in yeah. the description of this video so people can yeah. watch that too. But yeah. why did you think it's important to make a documentary about Sweden wanting to join NATO? What's well, the necessity to show the world what's going on? I, I mean, I just want to, it's a, it's a raw feeling. I, uh, I just want stories told that I'm free and something's inter and when something's interest me is usually when it's a taboo subject. I mean, I love penetrating taboos because it's where the taboos are that, that there's a real journalism to be made. So, so what's the taboo? Ha have, well, having criticized now the UK, I'm also an outsider in Sweden. So I see that when, it, when, when the small town I'm in, a uh, small historic cathedral town, uh, which was 100% white about 10 years ago, is now 40 or 50% non-white, you know, and uh, it's really totally changed the place. I mean, a very high unemployment and so on. And the Swedes dare not talk about it. You know, they change the subject. It's like talking about, can you think of the biggest taboo? I mean, I don't know, incest or, 
or anything that you think is the most unacceptable thing to discuss at the dinner table. That in Sweden is immigration. People do not want to talk about it. I mean, I, I've moderated. I, I think that that documentary was uh, what what happens is that the people who do talk about it uh, in the Swedish debate, so they sometimes use exaggerated language. But that's the scream of the desperate, you know. I mean, when somebody is quiet, you scream, and then that somebody says, oh, this guy's a madman, you know, when he's actually wants to be part of the debate. So I think that, um, I mean, it's tr uh, the, 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 the murder rate because of immigration has gone up, and Sweden leads the world in, it leads Europe in, in gang shootings. But let's, to be honest, I mean, the, the murder rate is 1.2 per 100,000, and it's, maybe it's gone up 30%. But it's still much lower than the US or Russia or many countries or lower than Finland even. So the thing is to strike the right balance. And it's true that many immigrants are, are hardworking and, and, and a lot of people are hostile to change. But I mean, I don't think that what's happened in Sweden is that towns all over the country are now no longer Sweden, you know, even in rural areas. And people are not allowed to talk about this, you know. And so I thought that uh, a lot of people without a voice and it's a small elite, as it were, in, in, in culture type jobs, you know, and administration jobs. And they all live in white areas and they feel that they are qualified to, it's almost like a class war. Because, you know, like in the 1970s and 80s, when I grew up under the heyday of European social democracy, the worker, the plumber, the factory worker was almost like the hero of European societies, you know. Um, and then like the bourgeoisie was a bit sort of, oh, they're a bit fancy and they're a bit oppressive and so on. And now we're living in a world where the, 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 the white worker, the white working class male is no, is no longer the, 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 the reference point of European societies. He's almost like the demon of European societies. And I've lived through this cultural change in my lifetime. And they're the same people. These are people who go to work in the mornings and work in practical jobs, you know, and they find themselves being demonized by Swedish journalists who sit there. Often they're females, you know, often they're women, young women, and they're extremely, they have very strong verbal skills, they're very vicious, and they dominate. I mean, if you'll see um, a morning program at nine in the morning, and it's a 25-year-old girl, she's just finished journalism school, and her friend, and the, three out of four people are women on Swedish television. And they go on and on and on about men and white men and so on. And, um, and, but they never talk about you know, other things. It's very one-sided. So I just thought I, I got to do something about that. And so I, tried, I made a documentary about immigration, which got 2 million views or something on YouTube. And then it was, um, it's possible that Trump referenced it because um, he talked, started talking about Sweden in his speeches before, after becoming president, I think, saying Sweden is an example of how things don't work. Because I know that some of Trump administration people got in touch with us. Then we sold it to Amazon, Amazon Prime, and we got a lot of money and a lot of um, coverage for that, you know, and a lot of people wrote to Amazon saying, you're not going to show this Trump documentary. So after three years, it was taken down, you know, they said it's not concordant with our values. And then uh, I made a film about um, feminism. Again, uh, you know, I, it's contrasting liberal feminism, which is women have the right to, um, uh, all kinds of jobs. Uh, I'm fine with that, but I'm against this kind of feminism that says that men are evil and that, that, that um, men, <clears throat> at the same time, there's no biological difference between men and women. That's total nonsense, you know. Of course there are. And of course there are intellectual, I mean, the, it's hardwired into our DNA, the differences between men and women. And a lot of the science says that. But increasingly, you can't say that in Swedish universities, you know. And that's, that's true all over the West, but it happened a little bit earlier in Sweden. And I talked to some Scandinavian academics who have tenure, so they can't be fired. I mean, there's a, the professor of logic at Lund University was one of our main sources. So every day he, he fights battles on behalf of the truth. He says, and he did a study, a, a science paper that showed that when women get academic positions, they have far fewer papers to their name than men who get academic positions. So what that means is that you say, well, fine, you're promoting women, but it's a zero sum game because if you <clears throat> promote a certain woman who's had fewer papers, then a clever man who's worked just as more hard doesn't get that job. So it's not 
everyone wins. It's a win-lose situation. And is that right? What it means, is, according to these professors, is that you end up with an academic elite who are actually less competent than the one the generation before. And maybe that's true of all our political elites. It's, we've, I mean, what you see now in the alternative media is a growing critique of the people who led us into this Ukraine war and the people who are leading us into COVID and, lead, and making all these wrong decisions all the time. And it could be that our, our political elites are very young, they're overwhelmed, they're, a lot of them are female, they're inexperienced, and they're chosen for ideological compatibility or something rather than their competence, you know. And so it almost feels like we're at the end of an empire just before the French Revolution where where people take over and normal people said, we can't have it, we can't have these aristocrats anymore ruling us who don't know anything, but who have status because they do and say the right things, just like the French aristocracy did the right thing. They, they had the clothes in a special way and said, we're living in that where you could say the right thing on, tele on mainstream television and, and you virtue signal all the time. And that qualifies you to be part of the TV, the TV aristocracy, you know, whereas a lot of more and more people are kind of more and more talented people are pushed outside the mainstream and we're kind of chucking rocks into the mainstream and saying, what, what, are your lead, what are these leaders doing to us? So that was the second film. And then I thought, the, uh, and, and in a way, I, I'm sort of idealizing the country I grew up in, I guess. And, um, you know, Sweden in the 1980s had, it was very pro-humanitarianism, pro-anti-apartheid, uh, anti-Vietnam War. But actually, it didn't let in many immigrants. And, and Olaf Palmer, who's now a hero for the left, is a sort of, I don't know, a sort of Gandhi, seen as a Gandhi figure almost, or a... Or a, a yeah, please yeah. explain, who is Olaf Palmer? Yeah, he was I'm, a Swedish prime minister. I'm quite sure that, 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 that hardly anybody yeah. knows who he is. Yeah. Well, Olaf Palmer is, um, was the Swedish prime minister from 1969 to 1986. And he was like... Willy Brandt in Germany. They were friends, and Bruno, Bruno Kreisky in Austria. Um, they were men of peace, social democrats, who believed in a mixed economy, um, who believed in promoting the working class and creating a, a level playing field for every class. But they did not believe in immigration. I mean, it wasn't an issue. And uh, they believed in having a good relationship with the Soviet Union because you couldn't afford not to, and with America. I mean, they were Western countries, as it were, and they worked together to, to create this. And, and probably in Europe, in Western Europe, has never been as equal socially as it was in the 1980s. It was after 30 years of economic growth after the Second World War, the leadership class of Europe in the uh, in 1980s were people who'd been 20, 19 or 20 years old in 1944. So they knew the terrors of war. They knew the good things about the European community, which was to prevent war. They were not nationalists, but they believed in their countries. And so, I mean, you can criticize it, but I sort of, I, I'm sort of using that as my pivot, my highlight, That's, that was a good society. And many, many Swedes will remember that as a good society. And, and West Germans, I think, too. And Palmer was very careful not to, um, played very carefully with the Soviet Union. And he, along with the Willy Brandt and uh, Bruno Kreisky, tried to invite the Russians into the European fold by not treating them as an ideological adversary. And when Gorbachev came to power, he, they met people who agreed with him because Gorbachev was very pro-Western. And he, I think he wanted to convert communism into some kind of social democracy. And I think a lot of Russians were with him on that, you know. I think they felt that communism didn't work, but they didn't want America. They didn't want the American version of capitalism. And, and Palmer kind of offered a way, because a lot of, it was okay to like Sweden if you lived on the other side of the Iron Curtain. You know, they went to Sweden and say, this is a completely, we're okay with the society, you know. So Sweden was very attractive. It was like um, Sweden's high point of influence in the world because it had been out of the Second World War, no infrastructure destruction. It had a fantastic reputation in Africa and Asia because it never had any colonies. I mean, you had Indonesia, Dutch East Indies, but Sweden had nothing. All they did was send aid workers and they had no bad reputation with the Soviets because they were not participants in the Cold War. They'd been neutral. Many peace conferences like Vienna 
and Stockholm were the two places where East and West could meet and discuss. And like the Swiss, many people said, are you from Switzerland? No, I'm from Sweden, I said. That's because for the British, Switzerland and Sweden seemed like two identical countries. They couldn't tell them apart. They say, why can't you tell Sweden from Switzerland? Ah, oh, because you're both neutral, you know. Uh, you're both not engaged in world politics. And that was true. So that was, and, and, and so, and then Palmer was uh, assassinated in February 1986, and that changed everything. And um, that's 35 years ago, but it's still a, a burning wound in the Swedish psyche. What did it change? Well, I think that it, it, it was a blow to Sweden's self-confidence, Sweden's self-belief. And I think that it sent signals to the Swedish elite that you can't do what Palmer did. You can't be an independent. You have to, ju you have to take sides. So Palmer had always been ostracized by the Americans because he, started, he demonstrated against the Vietnam War and they, they thought he was a lunatic. The British didn't like him very much. And I think, again, it was jealousy because Sweden was a small country, but it was something that stood out as an al a successful alternative. The Soviet Union was never attractive to a lot of people because it was a failure and it was a dictatorship and it was people drove these old cars. But if you go to 1980s Sweden, people were, it's like Holland, it was a very rich country, very modern, very democratic, very equal. So it was as equal like the East Bloc and as prosperous and free like the West. It was a perfect combination of the two, if you like. Yeah. So Thatcher, and of course, but Palmer... What, what did, did his assassination no, change well, for the Well, the assassination Swedes? changed. Sweden became closer to NATO after the uh, Palmer assassination. It was a gradual thing. His deputy became prime minister after that, and he was already a bit more pro-NATO. He was invited to Washington a few months later and given the red carpet treatment by Reagan. His successor, Carl Bildt, was very, very pro-NATO, and his party was pro-NATO, and he um, was also part of the project for the new American century, and became known as one of the most hawkish, who had a lot of friends in the neoconservative movement. Are you saying that the road to join NATO was paved there? I think it was paved after the Palmer assassination in 1991 and 19. In the 1980s and 1990s, it was a gradual process of um, rapprochement, if you like. What's the interest for NATO to, to have Sweden in the pact? Well, I think um, it's basically, it militarizes the northern flank of Russia and it gives Russia's big fear is it will be surrounded and crowded out. And so far, the campaign, all, all throughout the Gold War, Cold War, even the NATO and Denmark, uh, Norway and Denmark were NATO members, and Finland had a friendship pact with the Soviet Union, like neutrality, and that was the pact that the Russians wanted for Ukraine. So be free, do what you want, but don't be hostile to us. Uh, Finland was a Western country, totally as a democracy, but it wasn't allowed to, to kind of criticize Russia or be a threat to Russia too openly. It had a long border with the Soviet Union. So there you had two blocks, but then Sweden was in the middle like a stable balance. It was neutral. So the Baltic Sea and the whole northern zone was a zone of peace during the Cold War. And the Russians and Soviets had very few forces there, and the NATO had very few forces. The Norwegians and the Danes in peacetime did not allow the stationing of NATO forces there. So it was very good for the Scandinavians and the Russians felt confident that attack wouldn't come from there. What the membership of, what the, the Ukraine war has led to is that the Norwegians are now allowing the stationing of American troops there. They make, NATO, Finland has joined NATO, which I think is a very, very dangerous move. And there's even talk of the Finns joining uh, allowing American missiles and American troops on their border, which could be a direct provocation to war from the Russians, because that's what they tried to stop the Ukrainians from doing. Um, and Sweden, as the advantage uh, in the Cold War, 
the Swedes were going to join, the, the West wanted Sweden to join NATO as soon as possible after the outbreak of a European war. And my academic contacts who've written books about this have said that the plan was that NATO was going to carry out a false flag attack on Sweden within the opening hours of a NATO and that Russian war to bring Sweden onto the side of NATO so that the Americans and the British could station their aeroplanes in Sweden. Sweden would be an aircraft carrier because what would happen, the Soviets had much stronger armies on the main front, East Germany and West Germany, and they would invade and they would knock out all the American air bases in Germany. Germany would be maybe invaded. So they were going to use Sweden, if you know what, Sweden is surrounded by the Baltic on three sides like that. But they could fly in planes to Swedish air bases and use Sweden to attack Leningrad, to attack East Military Germany. Military hub. Military hub. And that was during the Cold War. And now they can plan to do the same thing. Sweden still could, could play that role. And they don't need a false flag. They've got NATO membership. To, so it's a dream. And the Swedish military, I think, always wanted this. It's always a question is, I mean, we, 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 we're used to thinking, those of us of, of a certain age think, oh, in Latin America, you know, you had these military fascist types. They're always on the side of the Americans. And then you had these idealistic left-wing politicians who were trying to fight like Allende in Chile or so on. It was the same in Sweden. You had some elements of the military that are always pro-American. And, and I think they struck deals behind the, behind the government's back, basically, even during the Cold War. And now it's out in the open, as it were. Yeah, but Sweden has this tradition of being a neutral country. That's right. Historically, going back for hundreds of years. That's right. And it's been... Being a mediator in conflicts. For some reason, there is not much uh, yeah. complaint about Sweden joining NATO because we have some footage of your documentary where that's literally right. eight people are demonstrating and that's about it. It's, it's pathetic. I mean, I think, um, as I said, it's part of Sweden's identity. Uh, a few years ago, maybe 70%, 80% of the population wanted to stay neutral. And then the media campaign after the Ukraine coup in 2014 pushed very, very much for NATO, pro-pro-NATO all the time. And so when Sweden joined, applied to join last year after the Ukraine war, it was maybe 60, 40. But still, even assume it's not a doctored survey, even assuming, even if you say the Swedes have been propagandized, you know, which they have and so on, and they believe, it's still 40%. And it's neither been the public, there was an election last year, it was off the table, Nobody talked about it in the election campaign. It was not mentioned. The press didn't talk about it. There's no referendum. Sweden has a traditional tradition of having referendums on controversial subjects. No talk about that. No press, no demonstrations. I think one thing is that the Swedes are used to this too trusting of their leaders. Somebody, some Iranian woman said to me, you know, we're damaged by war in Iran, but you are damaged by peace. You are not used to fighting for your rights. You're not used to thinking that your leaders can do bad things because you assume after 200 years of peace wow, and welfare... That's, that's an interesting thought. You, are used, you think that when your leaders do something, they must know something you don't and they must be better at assessing the situation and you trust them. But sometimes you shouldn't trust them. So Swedes are like lemmings off a cliff now, I think. And so even... Um, and I think that, you know, let's say with the immigration issue, uh, people who spoke up were so ostracized or they lost jobs and so on. Um, there's a very negative thing in Sweden now, and I think elsewhere, everywhere, people are very, very afraid of speaking out about something where they, they can lose their jobs. And so it's carried over. The people can smell the air. They know that you, you couldn't talk about immigration before. You can't talk about feminism in schools or, or talk about biological sex. And now you can't talk about NATO. And they know that. And they know that it's not worth standing up. I mean, it's not like a, it's not like a dicta it's not like Iran. You don't get jailed for saying the wrong thing. You maybe just lose your job or you lose some friends and so on. And that's what's led. And I said, you've got to speak up because Sweden could be in a war tomorrow. And instead of, um, and if you watch the Swedish media, the state media, they're now saying step by step, they're preparing people for a war. They're saying, um, are you fearing a third world war on European ground? Uh, yes, I do. 
I know how provocations happen. And I think that, um, um, but the, the population of the West has been so propagandized about the causes of this war that step by step, the Swedes are being taught to, to put their gas masks on figuratively. I mean, they're, they're, a few days ago, there's an instruction to every householder to go down and make sure they had their nuclear cellars ready, you know, against an attack. Serious? Yeah. So it's creating this war psychosis in the Swedish population. It's amazing because there are no signals so far that Russia has any no. interest in attacking Sweden. No. Unless Sweden becomes hostile to Russia. That's right. I mean, this is the security dilemma. The security dilemma is based on fear and, and power. So you're afraid of your opponent, so you rearm. You rearm and your opponent think he's going to attack me. So the opponent rearms and then you rearm because you're afraid of him. And so it escalates. Exactly. So, um, and the West is convinced that uh, Putin is a Hitler and do not listen to Russian security concerns. But and they, so honest, they surround Russia with a new... Everybody process. with historical insight knows that Putin is not a Hitler. I mean, I'm not defending him. That's right. But we have to be realistic. I know. I mean, our prime minister is a historian. Yeah. And he's talking nonsense about Putin's ambitions. I, so uh, there must be something else behind this story because they know Putin is not interested in invading Europe. The... Americans and the British have always been afraid of uh, a continental alliance. Uh, they're islands. I mean, America's a world island and Britain is an island in Europe. And they're used to having, being at the center of these networks of banking and trade and information and so on. And when the Chinese built this Bel Belt and Road Initiative uh, to link Europe to China, and then the Russians are building more gas pipelines like Nord Stream to, to Germany to provide Germany with cheap gas, that's sort of like an energy alliance. So Europe will benefit and Russia will benefit, but it will make Europe less dependent on the United States. So Europe has basically, Western Europe has been a vassal of the United States since 1945. It's the jewel in the crown of, of the Americans and, and to some extent the British as the, as the side, sidekick. And European independence uh, has grown. And, and I mean, let's say the Germans have economy has been dependent on, on cheap Russian energy and cheap and the connection to China. So this, this, the dread that what the British and Americans dread is an alliance between German technology and know-how, Russian tech resources and Chinese manufacturing. It's an iron triangle. And these links have been growing slowly in the last 10 years. And you cut it off by creating Going in between Germany and Russia, that is, you push the Poles and the Ukrainians to, into provo provocations against the Russians. You blow up the North, North Stream pipeline and blame it on the Russians. And now, of course, Germany is in recession. They're talking about deindustrialization. Germans can't afford to run their smelting, iron smelting works. They're exporting their own industry to China. And I'm, maybe everything I say is true of, of, of the Netherlands as well, because you're so dependent on, on the German economy. But so the Germany is, is in recession, I think, because of what the Anglo-Americans are doing. And um, one document, I mean, if you want, I, one documentary I'd like to do, which I've got a lot of research for, is the Nord Stream pipeline story, because that was carried out in the Baltic. So that, again, is militarizing the Baltic. The Swedes knew about it, for sure, and the Danes and the Norwegians. And... I think um, it was basically the Americans and the British carrying out an act of war against a fellow NATO member, Germany, because Germany is the main loser of this. Why doesn't NATO claim Article 5 defense against the United States? You know, it was an act of war. But now the official story via, via Seymour Hersh, who's this um, a very famous journalist who's publishing on, on Substack, is that it was the Norwegians who pulled the trigger. But I was in Oslo last week, and I've got very convincing proof that the Norwegians pulled out at the last moment. So, the, because they didn't want to provoke the Russians. So it was the Americans and the British after all. So they can't even claim plausible deniability. Now, I know that there was a meeting at the United Nations this week. The Security Council heard the evidence for the fact that the Norwegians were not involved at all. 
and it was the British and the Americans. And it'd be interesting to see if the Russians will run with this, because that's a very, very uh, incredibly provocative, you know. And also that the explosion was much, much bigger than we thought. Uh, almost uh, two kilotons of uh, TNT, not the thousand ton, um, one ton of TNT that we thought previously. So I don't think the Russians want to trigger a third world war, but it could be a casus belli if some of the hawks in Russia wanted to use it as such. So it's a very dangerous situation now. Uh, but that's in the Baltics. And I think that the uh, Swedes and the Danes and the um, Norwegians because well, what happens, NATO is like a mafia organization. You know, if you, if you want to join the mafia, you have to kill a guy before you can join. You have to kill the police because then it shows that you're not a police because you, you, a policeman wouldn't kill another policeman. And then they have a hold on you. You're a murderer, so they can go to the police. What NATO wants to do... No, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. So what NATO wants to do I'm is... Italian, it, so. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what NATO wants to do is wants to have everyone's hand in the till everyone's hand involved. So how do you get the Scandinavians involved? You get them to do something provocative against Russia so that Russia has a case against the Scandinavians to so make them guilty. So the, um, they want, the Americans wanted to involve the Norwegians partly because they could then blame the Norwegians, partly to make the uh, Norwegians a target for the Russians, make them an enemy. The R Norwegians pulled out. I don't think the Swedes and the uh, Danes were directly involved. That's not what I've heard. But for sure they know about it because it was on, off Danish territorial waters. So that's also a way, you know, if, if, if you, you have that information exactly that the Swedes know, then maybe they can leak some future date to some Swedish journalist and say, well, the Swedish knew about this. Why didn't you tell us, you know? So that becomes a hook on Swedish politicians. That's how it works. Yeah, you're talking about the scenario now, but yeah. your documentary is very historical. Yeah. And you have to know your history to yeah. at least understand the future or the actual situation. Why should people watch your documentary? Well, I think, I mean, I've watched um, um, Scott Ritter, you know, almost every day and, um, and the alt media in America, very, very well-informed people who have connections to the CIA, and they tell hundreds of thousands of Americans every day. Tucker Carlson, he has 100 million views on Twitter for his programs. So actually quite a lot of Americans now know that the uh, CNN version of history is completely rubbish, you know. Um, but there's a white spot, which is Scandinavia, because they don't, they're not, and I don't blame them. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a small zone, but it's very important for this Cold War that's happening because we've had this, Focus on the Black Sea, you know, there's drones flying, attacks on Crimea, but it could eke the, the, the Baltic Sea could be the next Black Sea, next zone of confrontation, which is even more sensitive to the Russians because it's close to St. Petersburg. And this is a zone, so Norway, Finland, Sweden, they've been peaceful areas for 200 years. I don't know if it's going to be a military fighting going on there, but it could be planes flying in and out sieges, you've got Kaliningrad, which is a Russian enclave on the Baltic Sea. Um, so what I fear is that maybe, <clears throat> I fear that Sweden will become a household name. Small towns in Sweden and on the Finnish border, we'll read about them as we now read about Bakhmut and Ukraine, you know? And but Sweden is still waiting for ratification of Hungary and yeah, Turkey. I, Do you think they will give the green light? No, I don't. So what happens next? It's such an interesting thing, because it could be, I don't know, maybe the Swedes have whispered to the Hungarians, don't ratify our application. I don't know. Because um, I know that there are some strong voices. Um, some of the senior statesmen in Sweden, people like Hans Bleeks, who was the anti, who was the Iraq war inspector and so on, and old hands in the Social Democrats say, this is crazy to join, you know. Um, I don't know. It, but uh, but anyway, what, what's happening is that Orban, and, uh, leader of Hungary, and uh, Erdogan, the president of, of Turkey, are saying no. And Turkey is a very important NATO member, so they're more important. The Americans, I don't think, would alienate Turkey. What's, what Turkey says goes. And I think uh, Erdogan is the most responsible leader in Europe, and, and Orban is the second most responsible leader in Europe. I don't know what about their domestic politics, but internationally, they understand the risks of World War III much more than any Scandinavian or West European leader. And I think that they realize that we've got to keep the down the temperature 
as much. And we do that by not making Sweden a member of NATO. And they'll find any pretext. At the moment that uh, Orban is saying no, because he said the Sweden calls us a fascist country. You know, it's like Rutte does the same thing, you know. Um, we're not fascist. But if you're going to insult us, we say no. So the Swedes are, we say in English, hoist on their own petard. They're paying the price now for their liberal arrogance, you know. But I think that even if Sweden did everything that Hungary wanted and Sweden did everything that Turkey wanted, the Turks would find something else. So, you know, it's almost funny the way they find some little excuse. So I'm hoping they're going to say no for now and forever, you know. And I think many, many, on my, many of my sort of Facebook friends in Sweden, I, could see, I, I use Facebook as a way of gauging public opinion because uh, I've got 4,500 friends and I just see what people, and more and more people are anti-NATO. And even though uh, they're not demonstrating, and as people are saying, let's hope that uh, the Turks save us, you know. So they don't trust, they're tr trusting a leader of an Islamist or whatever, Turkish Middle Eastern country to save them uh, when the Swede Swedish leadership can't save them. It's a very interesting development. Um, so, yeah. Let's, let's hope for a peaceful ending. Well, I, 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 as I said, I hope that they'll, they'll keep stalling for the next two years and then uh, maybe it'll be a very, because, and, and what happens is that um, Sweden has actually got quite robust defense of free speech. Even though it's a funny co combination of a country where people are afraid to speak out, but in, on the law, it's a much freer country than the UK, for instance. UK is not so free, even though they boast about it. So a lot of people have been burning Korans recently. <laughs> Outside in Sweden, in Sweden, and I think some of them are Christian Middle Easterners. You know, they're often the most anti-Islam, and they go to a mosque or something. They burn a Quran, and and the Swedes don't refuse to ban it. And I think that's to Sweden's credit. They believe in free speech, and free speech means you can burn the Quran. But as long as they do that, a Turkey will never say 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 yes. So it's an anti-NATO statement. It is, fact. yeah. So, so I'm wondering. I mean, may, maybe it's the anti-NATO movement uh, doing this. You know, yeah. um, I know one of the guys, Rasmus Paludan. He's a kind of international star now. But I, I, I think he does it because he's, you know, he's one of the neocons who, from the 2000s, who part of the uh, sort of Breivik wing of the Scandinavian. Uh, uh, but anyway, and he, I think he's pro-NATO, but he can't stop himself from burning Korans. Take a sip of the water. Pelle, thank you for joining us. Thank you. All the way for Sweden and you have to go back soon with the train again. Um, we'll air your documentary part one and part two very soon. Uh, ik hoop dat je het interessant vond om naar te kijken. Um, de documentaires deel 1 en 2 zijn uiteraard ondertiteld in het Nederlands, in het Zweeds en in het Duits. Deel de video's flink, want het is belangrijk werk. Het is goed om te begrijpen hoe dat eigenlijk door de jaren heen zich heeft ontwikkeld. En ja, ik wist er weinig van en dankzij Pelle weet ik er nu meer van. En ik denk dat jullie er ook meer van moeten weten. Um, als je een donatie kan missen, heel erg fijn, want we doen dit natuurlijk op eigen kracht. En elke maandag, woensdag en vrijdag maken we ook altijd een uitzending met Blackbox Today. En daar komen dit soort onderwerpen ook vaak voorbij. Deel de video, deel deze uitzending. Dank voor het kijken en Pelle, have Thank a safe you. trip back home. Dank you, thanks.